dude to audit the dude. So they don't know what taxes are and how many of your children know what taxes are and things like that, but that's kind of what makes the world go around. So I don't do a lot with federal taxes, but state tax I do. So I've been in that arena for quite a while. So the controller's office is responsible for the chief financial accountant, obviously for the state of Texas. Give me a guess from one to 50 on what the GDP of Texas is compared to other countries in the world. One in 50, like being the top one to 50. I heard seven, I heard 20, five, 15. Anybody? Yeah. 10, 11. We are the 11th largest economy in the world. So about 75% of all imports exports come into Texas for the United States. And then uh, we have a lot of innovation. We have a lot of things. So what kind of drives some of that is taxes. So who doesn't like sticking it to the man? Whenever you get a tax exemption, who doesn't like that? I like it. And if I knew how to cheat all the way, I would tell you. But, you know, there's not a legal way to do it, obviously, and things like that. But, you know, the things I want to teach you today is that with the controller's office, whenever you're starting out your business, a lot of people think about us last. Or they think about like, they don't think about the mess that can happen with bookkeeping or reporting and things. So that's part of my role is what I do is I do the aftermath. So who doesn't, who likes to do the dishes at home? You like to do the dishes? Wow. You're my bookkeeper people, you know? So when you're starting out in your business, you're getting excited about it. You're saying, hey, I'm getting my ideas out there. I want them to go out and build, create, design, develop get all these things rolling. I want to get my partners involved. What are all the people that I need to get done so I can make this product and make money? Well, the last thing that's usually thought of is the accounting or the bookkeeping or the reporting side. So that's what I want to talk to you about is like what you need to be aware of whenever you do start your business or start getting rolling or things you need to think about. How are you going to have that good foundation to go forward with, with what you need to... Uh, let me close my screen. Kevin? My PDF closed. Let me get my PDF up for that. No, it was on the music one. It's on that tab for the music. Anyways, um, so I've been doing this for about 22 years. And like uh, Tasha said, I started out as an enforcement officer. You got to start somewhere to get your foot in the door. But that was the best place for me to learn. I learned a lot because we were actually the first line of teaching people what they needed to know before they opened their business. So your booklet, we're going to go through it, not page by page, but a lot of it. So some of the things that we're going to go over is your seller's and purchase responsibility, your sales tax permit, records required, resale certificates. So those are some of the things I want you to have. And then I also want to show you generally where the website is as well. So on our website, the web address is comptroller.texas.gov. It's a wealth of information out there. And you use these banners up top. That's where you're going to find a lot of things. A lot of information about your state, our state of economy, and things like that, too. So we'll go through these real quick. So let me tell you what a rule is. So um, chapter, chapter 151 of the statute is the Texas Sales and Use Tax Code. So... Rough guess, how many taxes do you think Texas has? How many tax types do you think we have? How many? How many taxes? 70 types of taxes. Fuel tax, boat and motor tax, motor vehicle tax, coin operated amusement machine tax, um, motor liquor tax, Mixed beverage tax, franchise tax, which is the one that you're like, what's that? That's the corporation tax for privileges. So those are some of the ones that you're going to see. Seller finance tax for motor vehicles. So there's a lot of different taxes and fees that are coming up. But the main one we're going to focus on today is sales tax. So because that's the one that you're probably going to be dealing with the most as a citizen and as a business owner, you're going to be a tax collector. I know if you're going to start selling a product, it's going to be, you're going to be the tax collector. We just collect from the collector. So that's how that really rolls. But I want to tell you how that goes is the rule is what describes how we're going to apply the law. So chapter 151 of the Texas, of the, of the, 
of the statute is actually right here. I want to show you where it's at. So you click on taxes, you click on sales tax, and then here's the law. So if you want to read this tonight, go for it. Don't. I don't. I don't recommend it unless you're really tired and you need something to like put you at the edge and go from there. But chapter 151 is a statute. What we're going to go over is the rules. Rules are is the controller's interpretation of the statute. So if you're looking for specific, unique things about the statute, we're going to compartmentalize those things into topics is how we're going to talk about it today. So the first thing we'll talk about is your seller's and purchaser's responsibility. As a person who op operates a business, it's your responsibility to be informed. Just much like whenever you have a license to drive a car, you're supposed to know, hey, I got to stop at a stop sign. I got to yield right of way, you know. I take a right hand turn on red, except whenever it says I can't, you know, whatever, you know, don't cross the double yellow line. So, you know, you're not going to know everything. So I just don't want you to be afraid to explore and, and go into these rules and read these things. So this basically says, hey, as a permit holder, you're responsible. And it gets into definition. So again, the rules are statute or our interpretation of the statute. And it's really kind of layman's terms. But we also have good publications out there outside of this that talk about, you know, what, what is a responsibility? So as a business owner, I mean, how many of you all are looking to, are in process of about to launch? Okay. Do you mind if you ask you what you're doing, selling or? Mobile business solutions, such as? So you manufacture those or? Okay. Okay. So are they on a chassis, like a motor vehicle chassis, or they're on a trailer or they're a standalone unit? Okay. All right. So he's got a little different things going on. So he may have to be like doing customizing a motor vehicle, which could be subject to sales tax under sales tax, which it is. But if he's building it from the ground up, you know, then, um, you know, and he's actually an OEM and in Texas, you can't be an original manufacturer and a seller of a motor vehicle. Hence why we can't buy Teslas here. Right, people? I don't get it, but that's why. So back to your situation. So as a mobile solutions provider, the things he needs to set up for is a sales tax permit. It's his responsibility to get a sales tax permit, and that's going to afford him to buy the material that he's going to resell so he doesn't have to pay tax on it. And then he's going to charge his customers tax whenever he does that final sale on that item. So it's his responsibility to comply with the law and understand what's taxable and what's not taxable in this business. Now, the specific rules that are not in this book that we're going to go over today, but they talk about like, what do you do for customizing and all that? And I'm going to stick around and talk with anybody that wants to talk about what's unique to their business today. I got plenty of time planned out for that. These things happen. So <clears throat> it's your responsibility as a business owner to get permitted, to collect tax whenever it's due, and then to accrue use tax. How many of y'all have ever gone to Mexico and come back with something? or declared something. So Texas has this unique fund tax called use tax. It's basically sales tax, but it's basically, if you didn't pay tax on it in another state and you should have paid tax on it, had you bought it in Texas, then you need to remit it. So think of your times whenever you had Amazon, eBay several years ago, whenever they were all collecting tax. So it's your responsibility as a business owner to remit use tax. So it, you're basically going to be the eyes and ears for the controller's office on all that stuff and check whether people were remitted or, or whether they charge you tax correctly or not. It makes a difference. So whenever you're an oil and gas company, you're spending $3 million on an oil and gas compressor on a line, they're going to say, well, they're thinking about where we need to accrue the tax and what rate. That's what they're thinking about. Or do we legally owe tax to another state that we bought it in before we transported it to Texas? So those things matter and it can make millions of dollars of differences over the life of things. So that's some of the things we're going to, that talks about in sellers and purchaser responsibilities. So I'm going to fast forward to the next rule because some of these are just, anybody going to be a marketplace provider? It's going to sell things and, you know, um, I think, eBay and, and Amazon have done a pretty good job, but there's some other sidelines and things like this let it go, let it go, things like that. Anybody do anything like that or sideline? 
Okay. So one of the things that you're going to have to make sure of if you're going to sell on a marketplace is making sure that marketplace provider is actually collecting sales tax for you. Or if they're not, be sure and include enough markup in it or have the sales tax denoted in there so that it's not, it's fully understood that tax was due if it was a taxable transaction. Marketplace providers sometimes have a, you know, not everybody does it the same. So that's one thing you have to be careful about whenever you're working with a marketplace provider is that they are they thinking about the tax and the bookkeeping side, or is it just simply transactional? I provide the portal or they provide the portal and you provide the product. And then once the, the shipment and the order gets, you know, consummated, then, you know, everybody just does their part, but not everybody thinks about that. So um, let me give you a big case in point. Um, anybody ever get Wayfair catalogs? Or heard of Wayfair? So, yeah, South Dakota and Wayfair got into a big legal battle uh, about five and a half years ago. So, South Dakota said, hey, Wayfair, you're not collecting tax on anything that you ship into our state, and you should be. And it actually went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and for the first time in my life, in anybody's life, I saw that the Supreme Court said that digital nexus was sufficient enough for you to have to charge sales tax. So Wayfair ended up losing that case and we changed our laws in the state to, um, and gave people, gave businesses a grace period to kind of acclimate and get on board so that, you know, it was a big task for people to kind of say, oh, I've got to collect tax for every state that I ship to. Wow. Um, there are softwares and there's services out there to help you, but that's one of the things I want you to be aware of. It's not just our state. If you do, if you think you're just shipping, well, I'm shipping over to New Mexico or I'm only shipping in Oklahoma. Whenever you go into those other states, every state has its own taxes. So just be aware of that whenever you're, whenever you're going into business. So I want you to be surprised. And most large corporations have just teams of people that work with one state. And so they'll have an individual team for each of the states that they do business in. So just be mindful of that whenever you go and do work in other states, when you ship to other states, you may have a responsibility with that state. After Wayfair, it said basically digital nexus was sufficient, which is, you know, catalogs, flyers, even email address, you know, just sending a website. It was, it was really kind of unheard of because our founding fathers in the Commerce Clause didn't even think about that whenever they developed the Constitution that the internet was going to be a thing. It's great. Just stay where it's shipped to. And they may, or they may or may not have a tax. I think Montana doesn't have a sales tax. Uh, it's like me, like three or four. It's very few. They do not have a sales tax. Some have a gross receipts tax where you have to have a physical presence there. But it just varies by state on that. So you're right. And um, I imagine you're never going to turn down a check. If somebody wants to buy a product from you and they're in another state, you're not going to turn down the check. But just do your due, deal, due diligence and check with that state first before you before you go there because then a team out of my group or like my group would come in and say, hey, you sold something in the state and you should have charged tax on it. But that's why we have that use tax clause in Texas because then we only want tax once. Back to your question. So if you bought something from out of state and didn't charge tax on it, but you accrued the use tax and reported it, that was the correct thing to do. And if we audited the seller then and found out that the purchaser already remitted the use tax or was adjusted for in some other way, we would, we would do a no bill on it, if you will, is what we do. I mean, that's kind of how it goes. And I know we're talking about money due, but I want to kind of give you an idea about audit is not always about money due. I have lots and lots and lots of audits that we do that are credit audits. Um, we give money back because that's just the right thing to do. We want you to pay what you owe. And if you've overpaid, we want to give you money back. And if you've done nothing wrong, hey, we just go down the road and call it good. There's no incentive for us. And that's the first thing I want. People think, oh, you get paid a commission or some scheme, and we don't. There's no incentive for us finding money or anything like that. So fast forward through this. So this is the ticket that everybody wants. This is your sales and use tax permit. Or you make application for a sales tax permit for your business, you will get this piece of paper back. It'll be unique and it'll be unique only to your location that you're permitted at. So 
If you have more than one location, you have to secure a different a permit for each location. It's important. So how many McDonald's do you think there are in town? I mean, I didn't look it up this morning, but something like that. So each one of those has to have a separate permit. And then each one has to report their sales uniquely to the, that each outlet. And the reason being is because if one of those outlets is ever sold to another corporation or something like that, we'd be able to track revenues to that entity as well and make sure that, that everything flowed up correctly. And it could make a difference in their tax rate. So the tax rate in Lubbock County and Lubbock City limits is eight and a quarter percent. But if it's outside the city limits, it's 6.75%. Uh, Who knew that, right? So where, where you buy stuff matters sometimes. So there's people that I know that go and shop in other places just so they can save the extra one and a half percent of tax. I'm like, okay, that's fine. But this is what you'll have and you have to display it conspicuously. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Correct. If they picked the goods up there, but if you deliver it, you're obligated to pick up the additional tax if you deliver it into another taxing jurisdiction. So Ransom Canyon is an incorporated city outside the city limits, but then there's some areas that are just on the rim and there's people that have home-based businesses and things like that. So you're right, you, know, you charge tax if they come and pick it up there or if it's just a, a simple good that you're shipping for through the mail, you would charge tax based on your on the residence or the business address first. But if you're physically delivering it in your own company van or vehicle or something like that, then you would have to pick up the tax wherever you delivered it to. So that's, that's a good question. And then um, this is what you'll get in the mail after you've applied for a permit and it has to be displayed. A lot of places, you know, people are like, do I have to give a copy of that to anybody that I'm buying from? Do I have to give it to Sam's or Costco or you know, if I'm buying from an electric company or something like that, do I have to give a copy of this permit? You do not. You would give them a certificate that has this tax information on it and it would be signed. And I'll go over that here in a little bit. So that's the general nuts and bolts of that. And let me show you real quick where you can go and apply on our website. So we can all. So right here. We try to make it as easy as we can. Sales tax permit application. You can apply online and apply through our e-system or you can apply through a hard copy if you want. And you'll actually create a user ID and a profile and then it'll come up with an application that you completed. We started this after way before COVID did, but then we still require a hard copy original signature. So you'll get a page that you'll print out that has a what we call a wet signature, if you will. And then you could scan that, email it in or fax it, either one like that. And that's how it comes out. And then you get your permit back. So I just wanna show you real quick where those are at. And then records required. So if you're going to maintain a business, you're going to have to maintain good books and records. So back to my dishwashers who, or my, who love to wash dishes. Be friends with these people. <laughs> barely because she knows she, nobody likes to do the dishes do they I mean well, not nobody but you know s few of us few of us so bookkeeping is kind of like doing the dishes but you gotta do the dishes to eat off of a clean plate for your next meal who wants to eat off of a dirty plate especially since your dog's been looking at it for three times around you know you can only go so far you know like that but you know you bookkeeping is kind of like that for some of us not all of us I'll just say some of us bookkeeping is like that where I'm a nerd I like to do that stuff I like to enter stuff in I have spreadsheets for spreadsheets you know I'm just that kind of person and then some people like to do bookkeeping but not everybody's their forte they like to be out going doing the sales I like to do the fabrication the manufacturing the hands-on the the build up and they see the physical work of it 
mean, that's why you all are thinking about or are in business now is that you want to go and innovate and do something creative and, and do that. The last thing that a lot of people think about, and that's why I have a job, is that they forget about the guy. They forget about the man. They forget about the taxes. They forget about the bookkeeping. And the way the state sees things and the records required is, is and we try to be reasonable with people and understand where their bookkeeping is. And we try to help people before. And that's why it's as good that you're here today is to understand what's expected of you before you go into business. So um, how many of you have accountants or a CPA or somebody that does your taxes for you? Okay, a lot of them. It's fine. I use the H&R Block software because it's great. I mean, and plus they have good audit defense. And all that. So I will tell you this right now. Don't necessarily take it for granted that your CPA knows everything about state taxes because as I was saying earlier, there's over 70 taxes and fees. And then within the sales tax, there's so many little nuances about things. When you, if I gave you the rule on grocery stores, you would, it would drive your mind crazy going up and down United supermarkets and going taxable, not taxable, taxable. Maybe is it 50% juice or not? I mean, there's a whole lot of nuance to these things. So it can be that way. <clears throat> so Whenever you're working with your bookkeeper, or your accountant, or anybody like that, that's fine. Just make sure that you go ahead and do your due diligence with us. And you can actually write a letter to the office or to our agency and request an individual tax response. It's called a private letter. Really. So if you have something really nuanced, some of you are developing applications or mobile applications. Is it software as a service or is it actually buying the app or is it buying the software? Is it bundled? Is it not? You know, or is it interfacing? So that kind of matters. Some of you get into telecom. So there's some quirky things about telecom. Is it in-state? Is it out-of-state? Is it long distance? Is it not? Is it all bundled? So there's some things about that that you need to be aware of. So if you have some special unique situations, you can write a letter to the agency and say, these are the facts. This is what I'm doing. What is my tax responsibility with your agency? And then in turn, our tax policy division will write back a letter and saying, based on the facts you've presented, you've got to qualify it because if later on a fact is different, it, it's null. So um, there's a lot of quirky things in our law. I've seen a lot of strange things and I've seen contracts like this for IT desktop services and it ends up being, well, it's kind of mixed. Some of it's like software as a service, some of it's data processing and data processing has an 80% discount or 80% taxability and software as a service may or may not be taxable depending on where the server is located. It gets weird. So as you're navigating these things, I just want to show you where you go to ask and things like that. So records required, again, you're going to have to have a record. So have a good idea of what you're doing and be able to explain it to people so that you can kind of get that good guidance up front is what I would suggest. Because then you don't have to worry about like, well, and then you have detrimental reliance if we've written back to you and the facts are the same, but we got the taxability wrong. Then you have something that you can rely on that to your detriment and we would have to obligate, we'd be obligated to abide by that until we gave you good guidance going forward. So, you know, back to the record keeping part of your what you're selling is, is part of that. You have to have good conspicuous records or good detailed records about like what it is you're doing, the scope of the work. If you're doing a service, if you're doing a sale of a good, you're actually describing the good is you're saying I'm selling mobile washing stations, not pineapples that are exempt under the law. You're actually making sure that it, it denotes what you're selling. So we want to have good books and records. Who knows what the difference in cash versus accrual is? All right, so good deal. I'm gonna, Priya, call me out on what's cash? Which cash method of accounting? Hmm? Correct. Short way to say it when you get paid is cash, and when you pay it out, when you write the check is whenever it's cash. Accrual is whenever you've like, I've given you the goods, but I haven't got my money, but I still have this liability recognized on my account. Same thing. So good job. So why does that make a difference? And why am I talking about that? Who doesn't want to be a millionaire someday? You don't want to be a millionaire? 
Who doesn't? All right. Uh, but yeah, it's easier to keep your hands down. Does everybody want to get rich someday? All right. There you go. So why it's important to make a distinction between cash and accrual whenever you start your business. The cash method means that you're not paying tax, sales tax at you until you've actually received payment for it. If you're on the accrual basis, then you could, you could be paying lots of sales tax, even though you haven't been paid for it. And you may have accounts that are 30, 60, 90, 120 days beyond. And that makes a big difference. In order for you to recover from us, if it's an accrual basis, you have to declare it as a bad debt on your federal return. So that's the main thing I want you to get out of, of this is your records acquired has to be distinguished between cash and accrual and like what kind of work it can be you're going to be doing. So people use QuickBooks and people use other things. You can use hand tickets. Makes no difference. Not do what works for you, but have a way to have controls and be able to set it up so that you can see it. And if you're using somebody to prepare your returns for you, make sure you understand how they arrived at those methods. You can do that. Take advantage of those CPAs and bookkeepers that are doing that work for you and understand what it is that they're doing. Make sure y'all got it right. Because what you do today and how you set it up can make a lasting impact for your business. So let's say you, in QuickBooks, you have an invoice out in QuickBooks. That's probably the more common one that we see a lot of people use for home base. So, so you build out for um, $5,000 worth of services that are subject to tax, but you're going to let them have 60 days to pay it. But you've got a return due that's due within 30 days. You're a monthly filer, if you will. So it could be 60 days before you get payment of that $5,000, but you've got $480 worth of tax due, but you have nothing in your bank. But we want that check still, right? So you've got to come up with that $480. Is that, what, is that kind of... That's the accrual method. Now, if it's cash, you know, you're going to pay cash based on the date. The date you receive payment is whenever you're going to include it in that month's return. So, and just for the money, we file for the state of Texas and it's monthly, quarterly, or yearly, depending on how much tax you collect or it's due. Matter of fact, January 20th is the monthly, quarterly, and yearly. Everybody gets due at the same day and you're going to see mass chaos. Yeah you know, online and we usually do get extra bandwidth and servers and try to make sure that there's no crashing on those days. But that's kind of the accrual basis. So you in turn could be floating a loan if for somebody that may not have paid you or that may never pay you. And so, I mean, that can make a difference. And, you know, you, whenever you get up to larger corporations, you know, that's typical when you see that. And that's why they really pay a good attention to their accounts receivable. They don't want a lot of aging. You know, especially if you've got big ticket items. Um, we've all seen the oil and gas up, down, up, down. I mean, it's amazing how much it goes unpaid in, in that industry right now. Because they're right. And when money's tight, you're like, I need a little bit more. I mean, of course, take advantage of the, you know, you can offer those, those 210, net 30, you know, discounts if you want to. You can do things like that to incentivize your customers to pay early. But, you know, I'm, if you're not doing a lot of volume on, on your dollar amounts, I would recommend the cash basis. That way you're not on a tight float and having to get, you know, a line of credit on the side just to have your returns payable, for your, your sales tax returns paid. We just want you to be consistent about how you report. That's the main thing on that. Okay, resale certificates and sales for resale. This is what I was talking about earlier. The, excuse me. Um, again, you're not having to send a copy of, yes, sir. Like what kind of subscription? Well, it could be either one, actually. So it just depends on how you want to recognize the revenue. Do you recognize the revenue whenever you build it? Or do you recognize the revenue whenever you've actually received payment for it? That's cash is whenever you actually have money in hand or you've paid out money. 
accrual is like I build it, but I'm still owed this money and it's a liability on the books for somebody if that makes. So really back to Spotify, you know, it could be monthly and they would just have it based on the monthly billing on that. Any other questions for? <clears throat> so resale certificates and sales for resale. So a couple of different things. If you're going to be in resale, like where you're going to buy a good um, to resell, or if you're going to buy raw materials, then you would issue a resale certificate for that item before you before you buy it. So you don't have to pay sales tax on it. Um, let's say you're going to make keychains. I'm just going to use real simple keychains. You're going to make keychains. So you're going to buy plastic. You're going to buy the rings. You're going to buy the chain. You're going to not pay tax on any of those goods. But then whenever that's all assembled and you make that sale and when that transaction has occurred where you as a seller have made a sale, you've been received money for goods, the purchasers paid you back. That's when tax, that's when the tax consequence happens. So you wouldn't pay tax on your materials and then charge tax again on your final product again. So that would save you some time there. So, that would be a different thing. I'll get into that. That's just, this is just straight up resale. Like Best Buy doesn't pay tax whenever they buy like Dell computers or washers and dryers that they keep in stock. But they would charge tax whenever they have that final sale where nobody has issued another certificate. Yeah, there'd be a resale certificate there. Now, there's certain exemptions for manufacturing, and we'll get into that. That's some of the things I want to talk to you about because that is a big thing in Texas. We're very generous with that. <laughs> so, and we want to be because we want innovation here. So, see how tax kind of drives things. So. So the resale certificate, I'm not going to bore you again with all the reading this stuff. Federal and state government, if you do work for the federal, if you do sell to the federal governor of state of Texas or something like that, we're not going to ask you to have a certificate for them. It's pretty obvious for us. But if it's the first trade to what's happening now, we would do want a certificate or an exemption certificate or something like that. But if it's a city, state, or federal or county government, we're not going to ask for anything like that. If I see one of you billing Texas Tech hub for something, I'm not going to sit there and say, where's the certificate? And the reason why the certificate's important is because for other accounts is because if you don't have that certificate and they should have been charged tax, then you're on the hook in an audit situation to have paid that tax. Now you can legally go back, go back and bill them and collect that debt from them if you need to later on, that's fine. So if you're going to do um, like in your business, you know, with the mobile washers and stuff like that, Say you get big enough and you're going to be like, I'm going to just do wholesale only. And you're selling just to all these people that are going to be distributors and selling out to end users, if you will. And you're going to have like mobile wash uh, manufacturing company and then mobile wash distributors are over here buying from you and then they're selling out. You know, you would issue, get certificates back from them showing why you didn't charge tax because they're going to charge tax on their end at the final sale. That's why on that. Now, some of the things you cannot issue resale certificates for, you cannot issue resale certificates for things that you do not ultimately sell. Office supplies, your business computer, desks, chairs, things that don't go, that are not being resold, if you will. So I know whenever you go to Sam's, my parents have businesses, by the way, so I'm going back a lot with my own head. Whenever you get a Sam, Sam sets you up and they just automatically exempt everything you buy whenever you set up your account with them, with a business account. And they've gotten better in saying, is any of this for personal use now? So, um, but before they would just say, well, that's not on us, that's on them to figure it out. And it's kind of unfair burden to put back on the customer, but that's how they wanted to do it. Ultimately, they got it worked out where they're being more upfront about it. So you cannot buy things that you're not reselling without paying tax on, except for, and we'll get into the manufacturing thing a little bit later. So let me show you what this looks like. So this is a resale certificate. And these forms are all available online. They're in your booklet. They've not really changed in many years. So up at the very top is the name of the purchaser. So if you're selling something, you're gonna, or if you're the purchaser, you're gonna go and buy goods from a supply company. You put your name, your address, your phone number, city, state, your tax ID number. It's the number that's on that red, white, and blue certificate. And then 
the bottom is the seller's part. So whoever you buy from the supply company, I have a seller and, you know, that's who they're going to buy, fill that out. So if you come, if somebody comes to you and wants to issue you a resale certificate, you're the seller and you're saying, why should I sell to them? Description of the items to be bought. Why is that important? Because as we're auditing companies and we're looking at these certificates, we want to make sure that they're buying the things that they say they are. If they're buying mobile washing station stuffs from you, but they're actually in a, having a receipt that has something completely different and not even remotely related, where you're like, is this business or not? And like, well, no, you know, it should have been this. So that's some of the things we would look for. And then we try to get an idea of the business activity generally engaged in. Um, funny story, they were, we were auditing a dog groomer. Dog grooming business actually had a bootlegging alcohol moonshine business out of the back garage. So looking at the federal return, we wouldn't even know they had a moonshine business, except that they listed it as business on their federal return, which I'm like, why did you do that? It's completely illegal too, but they did because they were claiming all these exemptions and things. So that's been many years ago. That's, that's why it's kind of important. We were just trying to say, does everything really add up on our end? And then it helps you get a second guess of like, is it reasonable for me to accept these certificates? That's the one thing I want. Um, and the thing I want to tell you is that whenever you have these certificates or somebody presents you with these certificates, you are not obligated to accept them. If you're like, I don't, think I, sh I don't want to mess with whether I charge you tax or not. You're not obligated to collect tax or to give them an exemption or give the exemption to them. It's good business, but you don't have to. If you don't feel comfortable accepting it, because they can in turn come back to the state and claim a refund from us directly. Or they can offset it on their return if they have a business and they can take it as a credit on their return for taxes paid in air. Similarly. But you know, I'm not necessarily on the resale certificate, but the exempt certificate, a lot of times you'll have different companies. You're like, man, this doesn't sound like it's legitimate. This is, is exempt by law. They just have something very vague on there, but you're not obligated to accept it. And um, just tell them, I don't feel comfortable accepting it. I'm going to charge you the tax. You can go back to the state office and ask for a refund from them. It's real simple. They just write a letter, present a copy of the, of the canceled check or proof of payment. And then the reason why they're claiming the exemption. And then we'll look at it and see if we need to give them a check back or not. It's pretty simple. So that kind of helps on some of your end too, especially if you've got a big ticket item and you're wondering like, is this thing legit or not? I don't know, is a certificate, you're just not feeling like it's a, a legitimate exempt sale. You're not under any obligation. This happens a lot with farming and agricultural exemptions that we have in the state. You know, somebody thinks that, well, I should be able to get my belt buckle exempt. You know, I mean, you're not thinking about this or their watch or diamond ring. These are real things that I'm talking about that people have claimed exemptions on. They issue an exempt certificate because we have very lenient ag rules. And I'm like, well, it has to be used directly in agricultural production. So in probably the third week the controller was on duty when he got elected, you know, I was at a, in a meeting in Amarillo and we were auditing a company and the gentleman issued an ag certificate for a set of earrings, you know, and they're like $40,000 earrings. And the controller had already talked to me about it before we even got there. And so give me the background. So I did, said it was an ag certificate. He says, okay. So the guy actually cornered him at this cha chamber of commerce meeting and said, y'all are making us pay tax when I'm a farmer. I, you know, he said, you know, y'all charge you tax or auditing me. He says, are you, the, is it, what was it? And he knew what it was. The controller did. And he said, it was earrings. And he says, well, can you show me a picture of the pig wearing the earrings? And yeah, so, you know, no, it didn't, it didn't pan out well. But we got to be reasonable about those things on that. So as you get out here in these businesses, you may be talked into accepting the certificates or you're like, I don't feel comfortable with it. Pick up the phone and call me. I'll be the bad guy. I don't, I don't mind. I sat for two weekends in a row at a 
a hardware supply company, I'll just say it gently like that. And they were getting so many certificates in air and they were tired of getting dinged for it in audits. They said, sit up here for a Saturday. And one by one, as people got certificates, they said, what are you using this for? How are you using it? You know, I'm like, it's a garden gnome. How's that ag exempt? You know, just things like that. So just as you're in business and you're like, if it doesn't, something doesn't jive right with you or doesn't feel right, ask somebody. We'll be happy to be available to answer any questions. You know, my phone number and all that, my staff are, every, are available for that. So getting into the exemption certificates. So there's certain exemptions, charitable religious organizations under, but they've got to be established. So just because you say your church doesn't mean that you've gone through the proper procedures of filing and securing your nonprofit status with the federal government, you must secure that and apply with us for the nonprofit status. So, and there's a way for I can show you to look this up, but <clears throat> if you accept a certificate in good faith, you're not held harm, you're held harmless on that. And then uh, the gentleman left a little bit ago, but if you're buying something that has a special exemption under the law, you know, we're very generous with manufacturing exemptions in Texas. So how many of you have equipment that you're buying that manufactures or chemically, physically changes the product you're selling? Bend brakes, welders, um, lathes. Anybody got stuff like that you all are thinking about buying? There you go. So in Texas, if you have equipment that runs on electricity, runs pneumatically, anything other than hand power. If you runs on anything other than hand power, then you can buy that item tax-free without paying tax on it, as long as it's used exclusively in the manufacturing of a product for sale. So CNC machines, water jets, all those things are big ticket items. And as long as they're used to manufacture the product that you're selling, ultimately, we have very generous exemptions on that. Because some of those machines can be very, you know, a welder made two, three thousand dollars for a good one, you know. But then a CNC machine, a press, or a brick press, depending on how many tons it's going to be, it could be several hundred thousands of dollars. So who wouldn't want to save a couple thousand dollars if they could legally? So I just want to tell you about those. If you have those instances, call us. Excuse me. So machinery to repair other equipment would be taxable. Yeah, it's only the equipment that's used to, to make goods for sale oh the repair will be exempt the labor the labor to repair will be exempt that's correct yeah well actually the part would be as long as it still maintains its exemption on that one now we have what we call divergent use where like it's kind of a hybrid like hey occasionally we're going to make we're going to use the CNC machine. We're going to make um, something for the shop, you know, like a, a tool holder or something special just for the shop's use. Then technically, you have the use tax on the divergent use just for that percentage of time that it was used in a non-manufacturing or resale environment. But that's pretty de minimis. Um, best example I can give you that is like a silk screen printer. So like you're printing out 10,000 silk screen shirts a day. And then you say, I'm going to make a run of, I'm going to give all my employees t-shirts celebrating our 10 year anniversary. So we're going to run 50 t-shirts through. So you have to figure out some kind of calculation on how much does it cost? To, you know, what's the, what's the use of that, of that item? It's pretty de minimis, but I mean, my staff is not really going to look at that really hard unless it's got a lot of use on it. Uh, it's because it's just not cost effective, not material, if you will. On our end, but that's where kind of divergent use comes in. Or if you've converted from that item from manufacturing to a different use, but you've used it for greater than four years, you don't have to go back and pay tax on it. So the statute of limitations is four years if you're permitted. If you're not permitted, I can go back forever. So you know that. Statute of limitations. So Priya's writing all this down because she's got. So statute of limitations for sales tax is normally four years. Go from there. I didn't really get to a lot of my other stuff, but um, that's use tax. 
So when you buy an existing business, this is what I want you to be aware of. If you're going to go in and buy a business, make sure that they've paid all their taxes. We have what we call a certificate of no tax due. So this is the tax topic that shows you how to request that. So before you buy a business, you can say, controller, will you make sure there's not a tax liability? The controller will do one of two things. One, they either audit them and find out if there's a liability and disclose that liability, not to the purchaser, but to the seller. And then the seller can, and then the seller can talk with the purchaser and they can withhold the funds back that, to settle that debt. Or the controller has the prerogative to say, we're not going to audit it. It's not cost effective. And they'll issue a certificate of no tax due letter saying, hey, you're good to buy the business. You're not held for their liabilities. It happens a lot where people don't check with us to make sure that there's another, there's an outstanding liability, especially a tax liability with us. And then they end up being put on the hook for the liability of the predecessor. Is there? Well, we're only we're going to go first against the the operator of the business is what we're going to go against first, and then it's going to be pretty evident when a lien gets filed or something's awry, or like you know, and that's where the purchaser is going to come in and say, "Show me your certificate of no tax due letter." And if you can't get that, or show me your last audit, if they've been audited, and contrary to popular belief, we don't get to audit everybody. You know, maybe less than one percent get audited but you know as a purchaser you can say i want to make sure that you have a clean bill of health you know if you want to pay independent auditor do financial audits that's fine but they don't do tax audits that's us so you can ask for a certificate of no tax due from us as described in the publication and then the controller will say <clears throat> we cannot issue a certificate of net tax due to you at this time which means they really can't tell you they have a clean bill of health You, sir, you're welcome to call us and see if it's real. You could check it, but I suggest before you spend, you know, could be hundreds, thousands, millions, whatever, on a business that you make sure that it's clean bill of health before you buy it. <laughs> Get them on the mic. Um, sir, so accounting methods, credit cards, interest on sales, bad debts. You know, these are things that I just want you to mainly be aware of. So auditing taxpayer records. Guess what I do for a living? Again, I'm the dude that sends the dude to audit the dude. So you're required to have good records and books. That's what all those rules have been leading up to. Now, if we find in the course of the audit that you've overpaid tax and you're entitled to credit, we want to give it back to you in an audit. If we find that you didn't charge enough tax, we want to tell you where the deficiencies are and you can legally go back and bill those customers if you choose to. And if you have no adjustment, you're not going to see us for a long time. We're going to say, keep on keeping on. Thank you for doing it. Because, you know, you're the tax collector. I collect from the collector, if you will, is how that really works on that. So apologize for the, on that. So um, I'm kind of kind of end it there on the audit side and open up to a regular Q and A because it's a lunch and learn. So yes, yeah. uh, sorry. Hello. And I will stick around for a couple hours, really, just to help you with your questions because I know there's a lot of different unique businesses. Hassan, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I'm gonna turn up the volume real quick, one second. Okay, what's your question, Hassan? 
Thank you for the great talk, sir. Uh, quick question. So I'm a graduate of this uh, Innovation Hub Accelerator Program and some other programs as well. We got funding from uh, Innovation Hub to develop our product. It was a software product. Uh, for uh, tax year 2022, what, uh, sh how do we just, is that considered an income? If it has not been used, how do we play around with that? How should I classify it in my books? Like your grants? Correct. Okay. Since I'm not a federal tax guy, I can't tell you how to do that. I apologize on that one, Hassan. Um, I hate to shoot an answer. Anybody have an idea on that one? I apologize. Because it depends on the, because it's granted from a federal organization, is it not? No, from Texas Tech. Oh, from, oh, from LIDA. Okay, so Ganga, not Ganga, I'm sorry. I looked at her. <laughs> Taisha just told me that we're going to have a part two to answer that question specifically. So stay tuned for that, and we'll get that question answered for you, son. Perfect. Thank you. I apologize. I mean, I probably know the answer, but I just don't. I'm not the regulatory authority. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I just stay. Yeah, there wouldn't be any state obligations. You might, you would probably have to make it as revenue on your, it would probably be an excluded revenue on a franchise tax return, if you will. Hey. Are there any other questions from Zoom that we have today or any other questions in the crowd? Go ahead. Okay. So once you apply for a sales tax permit with us, the appraisal district will know about it. They check the rolls often. And then that's when they'll start adding ad valorem taxes on your personal property taxes for like motor vehicle, business equipment, machines. That's not in my purview, but I know, you know, just from seeing that done. So whenever you, if you do migrate your business from home to another location, be sure and tell them. So you're not having this now. Um, there's some discussion out there, and this is kind of an off, off the side, some discussion about whether you have a home-based business and you declare part of your home as a business expense, whether that pierces your homestead exemption. So talk to an attorney and see if it would or not on that. For that. I still have to have a physical location on my end to know where you're conducting transactions from. Yeah, I still need a physical address. Where can I physically come knock on the door if you do ignore me? So. <laughs> we had I'm going to take this as the last question one more you know being organized obviously is the bigger thing and then making sure you know your stuff and then practicing you know, running through some dummy transactions, if you will, depending on how you want to your accounting. If you, um, like what kind of service or good are you going to sell or are you thinking of? Oh, okay. Yeah, it just depends. There's some like, are you going to have a monthly subscription service? You know, do you need that kind of, you know, software system is going to do the constant billing for me and do it. Do you need automation? What's the volume you're looking at? Because if you're out trying to grow your business and do sales, but then you guys spend four hours a night doing all your accounting and bookkeeping entry, when are you going to sleep? When are you going to eat? You know, and do all the things that make you, you as well. So, um, you know, uh, the more you can get comfortable with a software system, the better, because that's how things are going to migrate eventually. I know there's lots of online platforms. You could do a lot of things in the five minutes you're waiting between customers or in a plane or wherever you're at in the queue. Um, QuickBooks Online is, a, is another platform that's out there. I can't really say that any of them are like better than the other. It just depends on how much volume you're going to be doing. I would say 
you know, just because what my parents did for business, um, you know, if you're going to have a hundred invoices a month and it's not recurring billings all the time. Yeah. I mean, doing QuickBooks is fine, but if you're going to have reoccurring stuff all the time, or you're going to go over that hundred, you're going to have to create just a little bit better stuff. SAP is very expensive and that's what, you know, you think of your Walmarts and those companies you use. Um, I've seen people do hand tickets even, but they keep them very well organized and they organize them by month and they have a roll tape and the totals up to it to make sure they double check their figures. So um, yeah, just make it a habit and, and get comfortable with it. Um, get somebody, if you don't know what you're doing with QuickBooks, get somebody to set it up right for you from the very beginning. You're garbage in, garbage out. So you could set up the wrong city, you could set up the wrong state, it's charging this astronomical weird tax, it's not doing it correctly, it's not accounting for the shipping location, so you've got to do all those things up front, and just it's going to take you a little bit to set them up right, and set up those accounts correctly from the beginning. If you don't know what you're doing, pay somebody to do it for you, and then, okay, can you show me how you did this, and then, you know, you can take on those roles, like, like I was saying, you know, with this. Everybody has their strengths, if you will. And you gotta plan that. But if you're starting small, you don't want to spend a whole lot of money on stuff that's not necessarily revenue generating. I understand. You know, it's kind of hard. But you can always have a backup. If you, while you're, you can run your QuickBooks and then also kind of just do a hand ledger on the side just to make sure that hey, something got missed, then you can go back and at least support why you made changes. Things like that. I was gonna mention that we partner with the Small Business Development Center. And they do QuickBooks training. And so you can, we can get you connected with them or just look them up. His name's Ray Laurent there and he does QuickBooks training for some of our startups here. So very in-depth training too. And so if you're unfamiliar with that, he does desktop version and online version. Is it free? It's free for, for us, I don't know. So go through us. Um, yeah, that's where it's Ray Laurent um, at the Small Business Development Center. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of um, classes, workshops, things like that. That's worth 500 bucks at least right there, guys. Yeah, Just free yeah. services. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sam, for your time. Right. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Coming out.